This is the Brain Chip Podcast. Hear from our thought leaders about neuromorphic computing, beneficial AI, and how Brain Chip's Akita is pushing AI to the edge. This podcast is a place for investors, practitioners, and anyone interested in the future of AI. Hello, everybody. My name is Sean here, the CEO of Brainship, and today we have a great guest for our podcast. Somebody I've known for quite some time, have developed a very close working relationship, and um, we're going to have a wonderful session here. Welcome to the podcast, Sandy. Thank you, Sean. I'm really looking forward to this, uh, to talk about uh, space and AI. Well, good. Well, let me tell the viewers what you who you are, and then I'm going to have you tell you a little bit about uh, about your company. So Sandy Hobbins is the general manager of Front Grey Geisler based in Sweden. Why don't you tell our listeners just a sentence or two about your company, Sandy, what you do and the market you serve? So we are really a space company. We do one thing, processor for space, and we've been doing that for a long time. We focus on you know radiation hardened parts that can fly at the most advanced missions. And we are really focusing on that single thing. It's very narrow-minded, but it's it's it fills a purpose and it's a niche where we are like well, top three in the world. Awesome, awesome. Well, talk a little bit about the journey. The company's been around for quite some time and it started, you know, let's say 20 plus years ago, and now it's become the de facto standard for European space processing. Talk about that journey. Well, we are a spin-off from the European Space Agency and actually the local um, university here in Gothenburg, Sweden, where we come from. Uh, it started off with, you know, two guys uh, working at the European Space Agency doing exactly what we're doing now, doing processors and silicon. And at some point, we, we just decided to spin off uh, and start a company. And that was really good for European space because suddenly, like a university project became a... A, a company that could, uh, you know, you could trust and we could deliver the products. And that that's how it started. It was very simple forward. Now, we were lucky in the sense that we knew the market, we knew the customers, we knew what people were needing at that point in, in time, and we could produce the right products. And of course, since then, we just continued down that road. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, let's talk a little bit about what's going on right now with, with Geisler radiation hardened fault tolerant SOCs currently orbiting almost virtually every planet in the solar system. What are some of the most interesting or exciting or challenging missions these technologies have supported? Oh, there, there are so many. And I, I always talk about, let's say the exploration missions, because that's what people, you know, find most exciting. We can talk about GPS receivers and uh, all of that. We're, we're on board all of that, but the, what excites me is the exploration. And one of the coolest things we've done is to land on an asteroid. That, that was the first. So we went with the Japanese mission called Hayabusa 2. And on that one, they had a small uh, module designed uh, in Germany, but where we designed the whole computing system. It actually landed on an asteroid and stayed there you know, operating for like, like a day. That was really cool. The other ones recently, talking about asteroids, we were on the DART mission, NASA's DART mission, which basically deflected or at least pushed aside a, an asteroid as part of the, you know, the Earth Defense Program. And, and now we're also actually on the follow-up mission, which is the European HERA mission. So often we, we we are like on both the American side and the, the European side. So going, for example, to the sun, we're on the U.S. Uh, Parker Solar Probe, which is the fastest object in space, right, <laughs> that, that mankind had built, but also on the solar orbiter from... Uh, from Europe. And of course, we can talk about Mars. We're on the Perseverance rover, picking up now dirt to be sent back to, to Earth. And I don't know how many times we've gone to the moon and landed on, on, on different sites of the moon. So all that, you know, as you say, we are almost on every planetary body that mankind has gone to so far. Very exciting work. Never a dull moment in your office. <laughs> um, look, let's talk a little bit about our relationship. What inspired you and us to work together from your point of view? That's one. And two, can you talk about what brain chips are key to processing and does for you and complements the technology in your space applications? Yeah, I mean, the it's serendipity, right? That's how, how we met. We and, and actually the hard work of a uh, former colleague at the European Space Agency, uh, Laurent Hilly, he introduced... Um, us to Brainship at the conference uh, two years ago in in France, uh, where we you know we start learning more about what you guys were doing and how that could sort of complement the the products we have, um, and it was actually it was very important that moment because somebody for the first time 
like an agency could commit to a technology that was worthwhile pursuing before they've said, oh, put that in an FPJ, make it programmable. There was really nothing that could be for us as a component vendor to actually build. And now suddenly we had a technology that everybody believed in and made sense. And of course, the number one thing that, that it does for us uh, in, from a space perspective, it is the power, you know, the low power, the edge computing. And, and that solution wasn't there. And it wasn't, you know, there are many, many variants of processing in the world, obviously, but to find that specific one that will make a difference, I think that's, that's how it all started for us. That's a, that's a wonderful answer. That was fantastic. Um, you know, you, you operate now, we will operate in some of the harshest environments of space um, in really mission critical applications. How do you see, see space proven technology translating into things such as autonomous vehicles and medical equipment later in later stages? Yeah, and there are like two answers to the question. One is medical, and even even nuclear plants, you know, power plants, it is the radiation hard. So that's number one, is what we do, let's say, on, on the silicon level, how that can be applied to the, those areas. That, that's sort of the, the, the first question. The other one is, of course, the fault tolerance, the security. And there we see definitely a spin out from ESA uh, and, and NASA into uh, automotive uh, as well and, and aerospace. I think those will be those who are closest to us from, from the full torrent aspect. And look, with all the, you know, automotive cars and, uh, you know, the mass deployment of, of self-driving cars, and also when we go to shrinking technologies, you know, we're talking about, you know, two nanometers, 18 angstrom. When that happens, then the susceptibility in those chips will increase. So all we do there on fault tolerance will actually be highly uh, necessary in order to drive all those cars. Couldn't agree with you more. Could not agree with you more. Um, with grain evaluation kit being said to be available in this summer of 25, talk about the opportunities that you see for developers and researchers exploring this new technology. Yeah, so, you know, with everything in space is uh, until it's flown, it's not proven, right? But but it's actually another truth. And that is until you put it on somebody's table, nobody will use it. So one of the things we do here is just, you know, we go quickly and take an existing chip that we have, a Red Heart chip, and we take one of your EVAL uh, board, put them together. So we have something that somebody can put in their hands already this summer. And so you take the pe people who are already experienced with our space product, and that's a lot of them, obviously, right? Uh, and you give them now an entry port to, to work with, with the neuromorphic processor in a combination so they can go from one environment to the other. So that's the first thing. And then we also give them a teaser of what we will have, you know, a year from now on the table where we'll have all this integrated in a single chip. Obviously, we cannot do all of it. We cannot get the whole full performance of it. It will obviously not be directly low power because we're using, you know, all the technology. But Combining that and what we're designing, it will give them a, a taste of it. So I think that's 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 how you do it. And when they can see that and feel that, and also with the application we're going to help them with, because we do a lot of application development together with you and other partners, um, th that will sort of tease them to to look into into this technology. You know, you and I have spent a lot of time together and talked about a lot of topics, and I know you have a view on this next one. Talk about the long-range view in the, of the intersection of space and neuromorphic technology. You know, I, I believe, and I know you and I have talked about that, this is still very early in our journey. Uh, I, think, I think we're coming out really strong, but I, I see so many possibilities. Share to our viewers, viewers a little bit longer what five and ten years look like to you. Yeah, I mean... With everything we do in space, uh, number one thing is we don't really know what's going to be in the future because we have such a long lead times on everything. Now, the cool thing is that when the future comes, suddenly somebody comes up with a different way to use a product. I mean, some of the chips we did was for control functions, and now they're used in, in payloads. I believe this will same thing will happen with the grain product, is that today we, we obviously look at, at, at vision processing, we look at autonomous uh, you know, docking, landing, all these things, and, and where we really are at the, at the low power. Now, if you start combining that technology and 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 whatever will come down the road uh, is, a, is a solid foundation, right? And we have a couple of things that are important, right? We have the fault tolerant, we have the rad hardness, we have the low power, we have a great ecosystem. And when it comes around the software, so all of that will be, is a foundation to go forward. Now to speculate exactly how it will look in, in five years, well, five years from now, we might have already two, you know, uh, neuromorphic processors on the market. 10 years from now, we will see uh, technologies like seven nanometer and beyond being used in space. And of course, 
with, with the trajectory of, of having a, let's say, standardized way of going forward, like we do on the processor, we use risk five on the processor side, everybody uses that now for space, with neuromorphics and having the same trajectory going hand in hand from one technology node to the next one, this will, you know, enable applications I don't think we can even imagine today because the power will go down and it will be easy to deploy these chips everywhere in your system, right? Not only on the edge, but also combining them with, you know, chiplet packaging, um, uh, doing, you know, 3D packaging, et cetera, into even more powerful compute nodes. Could not agree with you more on that either. And, you know, I know you and I both view this as a very long-term relationship, and we look forward to walking down that long-term journey with you as a, as a very good partner. Um, let's let's give some advice for new other companies, other companies and other innovators that are interested in exploring space applications. What advice would you give them on leveraging fault-tolerant event-based AI technology? Oh, first of all, get started, right? And that's we spoke about the starter kit, uh, dev kit. We have to get it out. People have to get started and 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 sort of explore this technology. That that's number one. The second thing will be also on the sensors, right? On event-based sensors start looking around what's available in the commercial domain because that's how it starts like can you use them in your space application can you combine them to something and assume that five years from now those sensors will be available in space as well and hey we're already giving you the the the, the back-end processing here with with the green uh, product range so i think that that's the way to go forward uh, I, I think also the expansion of, of, of areas. I mean, traditionally, we've always been talking about visual processing. Everybody talks about that. But we've seen already applications where you can you know, optimize uh, communications. Uh, you can, we can look at uh, long-term diagnostics of, of spacecraft failures and stuff like that. So there's, there's a quite a few things that, that, again, there's not a lot of data. Data comes now and then, right? Event-based. And, and we will have to react to that and also train these things accordingly. So I think that will be the, the well, that's the area of the innovation where you want to go. And uh, wow, get started. That's my advice. Good advice. Really good advice. Well, with that, let's bring the let's bring the podcast to a close. Let me ask you one final question. And along those lines, those people that want to get started and are interested in learning more, how can they get involved with Geisler and Brainship and connect with your team? And it's probably a real good chance opportunity besides talking about how to connect, you know, maybe say a few words about the evaluation kit itself. Yeah. So obviously, like, you know, in this time and age is follow us on social media, follow us on LinkedIn. There we have a huge following there. And that, that's, you know, the place to be if you want to see what's new. And both of the companies are really good at that. Uh, another, another thing is obviously we spend a lot of time at conferences where we send people, you know, to the US, Europe, Asia, everywhere. You know, we're going to hit a bunch of cities, Seattle, Colorado Springs, Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, you know, on the US and you know, places like Space Tech Expo in Bremen. So that's really a good opportunity to meet our experts. Uh, now, the eval kit, uh, what we're going to do is is make that available for people who want to try that out. So obviously, you can go either through Brainship, they know us, <laughs> they will find us, or you go to, through through um, through Geisler.com, very simply, and, and talk to us. Because we are really eager to get this technology out, right? Uh, we are, because space is long term. It takes us a year to get the silicon out. We want people to start trying it out and, and go on. So I think those, those, are, those are like the the best way to 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 get hold of us another one is if you happen to be in europe right we have a risk five in space workshop going on here which again there will be um, brain chip is there we are there we're presenting actually uh, the new grain product series at that event and there will be much more information coming 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 to you soon great great so sandy i'm going to bring this to a close but uh, as always it's a true pleasure to spend time with you and talk and congratulations on this wonderful work that you're doing Fantastic to be on this pod. I, I really enjoyed it. And I look forward again to visiting to you guys in Los Angeles. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Brain Chip Podcast. Please remember to rate and review on your favorite podcast platform.